Hi, everyone. I'm Lori, and I'm very happy to be opening up tonight's webinar. It's a very special night as we conclude our COVID-19 and IBD webinar series for the summer, and hopefully even longer than the summer. With vaccines more available, COVID-19 numbers declining, and cities opening up, we're looking ahead with hope and optimism. We are so grateful that through it all, we have been the organization that you could turn to for help and grateful that we have such an incredible community of support behind us. And on that note, I wanted to touch on the Gutsy Walk, a great example of community spirit. We recently had our annual Gutsy Walk held on June 6th. The event brought our community from coast to coast together to drive awareness, to support each other, and to fund the next set of promising research. Many of you participated and supported this important event, and I wanna thank you. With your help, we were able to raise over $2.3 million, quite an accomplishment. It was really inspiring to see all the people and organizations coming together to help the IBD community. Gutsy Walk is an important annual event that funds the year's new research grants, as well as programs that support those affected by Crohn's or colitis. I got to participate in our grant review process recently, and it was exciting to see so many new projects hoping to get funding from us, and great to see such rigor to the project selection process. Gutsy Walk really helps to sustain and fund these grants. Because of you, we can drive forward important research work. And because of you, we can continue delivering programs like these webinars. A huge thank you to our volunteers, our donors, organizations, researchers, and healthcare providers for everything you continue to do. We have a promise. Crohn's and Colitis Canada believes deeply in our mission to cure Crohn's and colitis and to improve the quality of life of everyone affected by these chronic diseases. We're working hard to support you with information, resources, and through research. As always, this information and the webinar recordings can be accessed on our website at crohnsandcolitis.ca. Tonight is our 26th webinar and our last COVID-19 and IBD webinar for the season. Behind it all is our COVID-19 and IBD task force. Right there from the beginning, the task force ensured the questions were answered and that the resources and guidance was in place to help our community through the crisis. Most recently, they've completed a report on the impact of COVID-19 on people with IBD that summarizes this effort. And you'll find out more about this report tonight. We are so very thankful to have this team of IBD and infectious diseases experts to help guide us through the pandemic. Many of them you've met throughout these webinar series, and some of them are here tonight. I want to take a moment now to recognize this incredible team who volunteered their time and expertise toward this comprehensive effort. Thank you to the COVID-19 and IBD task force members. Dr. Lisa Barrett, Dr. Charles Bernstein, Dr. Mark Burdett, nurse practitioner Yusha Chohan, Dr. Cheryl Fowler, Dr. Jean-Eric Gia, Dr. Deanna Gibson, Dr. Ann Griffiths, Dr. Jennifer Jones, Dr. Ellen Kunzig, Dr. Rena Kana, Dr. Peter Lakatos, Dr. David Mack, Dr. John Marshall, Dr. Remo Panaccione, Dr. Cynthia Siao, and Dr. Laura Tergalnik, and patient advisor, Sandra Zielinski. And of course, thank you to our fantastic task force co-chairs, Dr. Gil Kaplan and Dr. Eric Benchmal, who have been here from the start to lead this comprehensive effort. Please join me in a round of applause. Although we can't hear you, we know that there are thousands virtually cheering right now. 
Thank you to all of our panelists who are going to be speaking to the group tonight. Thank you also to BG Communications and Mike the Interpreter for providing live French language interpretation. And again, thanks to Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Benchamal who will moderate this evening's webinar. Dr. Gil Kaplan is Professor of Medicine at the University of Calgary. He's an adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist, and he's the past chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council. Dr. Eric Benchmal, Professor and Pediatric Gastroenterologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and the University of Toronto, NASPGAN Canadian Counselor, and the Chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council as well as a Crohn's and Colitis Canada board director. Thank you everyone and wishing you our very best to you and your families for a wonderful and safe summer. Thank you, Lori. Thank you very much, Lori. Eric, I, I can't believe that it's July 7th, 2021. I, I still remember the very first webinar we did on March 19th, um, it was like 26 webinars ago. And in that webinar, we, we told everybody in the community that we would be here doing these webinars week after week, month after month, until we were at a point in the pandemic where life was getting closer to 2019 than it was to 2020. And, and I think we're, not that we're out of the woods per se completely, but I think we're in the best place we've been to since the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think the availability of vaccines has really changed the game. And I really looking forward to opening up. I mean, obviously you're in Alberta and they've opened up and everything is wide open. In Ontario, we've taken a more measured approach and not quite everything is open and we're, we're much more careful, I think, this time around. But uh, I'm looking forward. I mean, I think things are looking really, really promising for the fall. So it's good news that this might be our last scheduled COVID-19 webinar because, you know, it seems like we're finally coming out of it. Now, obviously, we're going to be here if you need us, if something changes, if new data comes out, new science comes out, we'll be here to give you that information. But we're acting as if we're almost out of this. Yeah, And, and tonight's webinar is a special webinar. Um, I was really glad that we actually showed the photos of the task force members. We, we always thank them every every um, webinar, but we never actually, I don't think actually have shown their pictures, but you probably recognize most of them as as panelists um, uh, on different webinars and so like that. And many of them will be on tonight. And, and today is special because um, we are gonna be discussing the uh, impact of COVID-19 and IBD impact report that um, we put together. Um, and, and I think maybe what we'll do is I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, and um, what Eric and I are planning on doing is just doing a high level overview um, of the report. And I think what's exciting is that we're going to have the leads of most of this report come and join us after this presentation um, in order to kind of take a deep dive in, into things. So um, like I said, the theme of tonight's uh, webinar is highlighting the uh, impact of COVID-19 and IBD in Canada. Uh, this is a hundred plus page report prepared for Crohn's and Colitis Canada in order to understand the impact of COVID-19 on the IBD community living in Canada during this first year and a bit of the pandemic. Um, this report took approximately six months to create. It involved over 30 individuals whose expertise ranged from adult to pediatric gastroenterology, basic science, infectious disease, public health, and, and also patient perspectives. Uh, Eric and I had the privilege of co-chairing the report, and we want to provide you with just a high-level overview in this presentation. As I said afterwards, we're going to invite the leaders of each of the sections to, of the report to discuss their chapters in, in detail. And I should say, I, you know, this report is for all of you. This the report is written so that all of you can understand, we hope, and written in very simple language with a glossary to translate some of the scientific terms. And it really should summarize nicely what all of you learned in the past year and a half about COVID-19, about vaccines, about IBD healthcare, how it's changed and how it will change. And so we think that you're going to find it very useful to read about. And uh, it's a little bit of a long bedtime read, but it's not horribly detailed and too, too long. It should be pretty exciting. There's lots of nice graphics. So we'll start by kind of reviewing what we're, what we're talking about in the report. And then we hope that you go and download it and read it on your own and, and let us know your feedback. Tell us how you feel about it or how your life has changed over the past year and a half. Absolutely. In fact, this is a picture of Eric and I, I think I've showed this before, when we were at a Toronto Blue Jay baseball game. This was before the pandemic. Um, and I still can remember on March 11th when the WHO announced that COVID was a global pandemic. 
Eric and I met with the executive leadership of Crohn's and Plays Canada to strike uh, the COVID-19 IBD task force. Um, we invited a nationally representative group of experts to serve on the task force. Um, you can see the task force is listed inside the circle of the image I just um, showed you. And outside the circle represents individuals who provided expert guidance to the task force. And roughly six months ago, we developed a steering committee to organize a policy report on the impact of COVID-19 on the IBD community in Canada. Um, the objectives of the report are threefold. Uh, the first, we wanted to create it, an up-to-date overview on the burden of COVID-19 on IBD in Canada. Our, our second objective was to raise awareness of COVID's impact on the IBD community um, and to um, have this be available to a number of stakeholders, including patients, healthcare providers, academics, decision makers. Um, and third, our policy report provides guidance to the special needs and the delivery of care for those with IBD during and, and hopefully also after the pandemic. So our steering committee was chaired by Eric and myself. Uh, the committee included the following national IBD experts, Charles Bernstein, Alan Bacon, Jen Jones, Ellen Kunzig, Kate Lee, Sanjay Murthy, Laura Turganowick, and, and Joseph Windsor. Um, the steering committee developed eight working groups, each represent a separate chapter in the policy report. Uh, these working groups include epidemiology, knowledge translation, children and expectant mothers with IBD, seniors with IBD, risk factors and medications, mental health, vaccines and healthcare delivery. Dr. Alan Kunzik uh, coordinated a systematic review of the literature that provided the relevant articles for each chapter. Uh, the working groups communicated via video conferences. Uh, drafts of each section were reviewed iteratively by the working group and the steering committee. Um, following stakeholder engagement, the policy report was launched today. Uh, additionally, the executive summary and the eight chapters of the policy, policy report are currently under review to be published as nine separate chapters in a supplemental issue uh, in the journal, the, Gene uh, the journal of the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology. Uh, Dr. Kunzik will be joining us in the next segment to discuss the methodology of putting this policy report together. Over the next 10 minutes, Eric and I will provide a high level overview of each chapter of the report. I'll start with the two chapters covering the epidemiology of COVID and CCC's knowledge translation strategy. So Dr. Stephanie Coward led the working group defining the epidemiology of COVID-19 on IBD. Uh, she'll be joining us in the next segment to discuss the epidemiology chapter. As part of her PhD in epidemiology, she collaborated with the Canadian Gastrointestinal Epidemiology Consortium to study the prevalence of IBD in Canada. That's how many people are living with IBD. You can see that here in the figure that she created. Um, her work revealed that the prevalence of IBD is roughly 0.75% of the Canadian population in 2021. Today, over 300,000 Canadians live with IBD. In fact, she forecasted that the prevalence of IBD will climb to nearly 1% of the Canadian population by 2030. Since March 2020, Dr. Carrot has crunched numbers on the epidemiology of COVID in Canada and across the world, providing this data to our team so that we can present the most up-to-date information during our webinar series. Uh, our webinar series started back on Thursday, March 19th. And back then, if you remember, and you can see this on the, on the table here, um, there was about 250,000 people in the world diagnosed with COVID, 850 cases in Canada, uh, 20 were in the IBD Secure International Registry. Um, and as of the end of June, it's over 180 million people, 1.4 million in Canada alone, and over 6,200 cases of IBD patients who've had COVID in the Secure IBD Registry. Uh, the figure shows us the daily number of cases of COVID diagnosed over the past year in Canada. Our country has lived through three devastating waves. However, as we enter the summer of 2021, public measures alongside vaccination programs has caused daily cases across the country to plummet. In response to COVID-19's pandemic, Crohn's and Clay's Canada's COVID-19 IBD Task Force synthesized relevant knowledge on a regular basis and communicated with the IBD community in real time through expert-generated online tools, which Eric will be sharing in a moment. And of course, this, this webinar series that we, we created for the public. Uh, Dr. Joseph Windsor will be joining us after this presentation. In addition to being the editor of the COVID and IBD Impact Report, he was instrumental in the COVID-19 IBD Task Force Knowledge Translation Strategy. In fact, he created many of the slides I've shared during my uh, presentations during these webinars, and he's edited a lot of the webinar videos for, for YouTube that people can watch um, if you're not watching this live. Uh, this slide highlights the impact of our webinar series. Our first webinar back on March 19th, titled COVID-19, What You Need to Know, over 2,600 people registered um, for this webinar. And since then, it's been viewed 10,000 times uh, in the last year. 
Uh, in fact, our webinar on vaccines back in January had over 3,000 registrations and over 4,000 people had viewed it uh, in archived videos. Um, uh, we've completed 26 webinars on COVID and IBD. We've had over 30,000 people register. Uh, impressively, many people have registered for more than one of them. And while our live audience exceeded over 12,000, so many more have actually watched the archived videos. Uh, we've also had unprecedented traffic to Clones and Clitus Canada's website, which has housed our task force evolve and recommendations. I want to ask Eric to kind of come on and show you the website and where you can find the COVID-19 IBD impact report. So I'll, I'll stop my screen and I'll give it to Eric here. Oh, Eric, you're on mute. I'm sorry, my mistake. So <laughs> you should see uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Canada website now and shout out to Sherry Pang, who I know is in the audience. I've known Sherry for over 10 years. She got me involved in Crohn's and Colitis Canada in Ottawa and uh, started off as a volunteer and now leads the chapter. So hi, Sherry. But um, let's look at, if you go to the COVID-19 and IBD website, so that can be, you can go directly to Crohn's and Colitis.ca slash COVID-19 if you want to get directly there. But just a reminder that there's these different chapters on the uh, website, different sections. And so, for example, if you wanted to know more about vaccines and, you know, the evidence around vaccines in IBD patients and so on, and what our recommendations are, you click on the vaccine section and there it is. You scroll to the bottom. There's a frequently asked question. So I've already seen some vaccine questions in the Q&A section. Hopefully in this uh, FAQ, there should be the answers to your questions as you need them. But what I wanna focus on today is really the, the uh, report. And so you scroll down to the bottom of these sections and you get the COVID-19 and IBD report uh, in full in PDF format here. Um, you can see all of the people that were involved in creating this report, uh, a long list of people who helped us write the report, edit the report. Uh, we're gonna be translating the report to French as well, unfortunately. Uh, things got to be a little bit last minute and we didn't have the French translation quite ready in time for launch today, but within the next few weeks, there should be a French translation online as well. So don't, don't fear. Um, and each of the chapters shown here really is written in a way that uh, the, the standard public member, you know, patient should be able to understand and hopefully, you know, uh, we'll, get something out of the report and understand it well. It starts off with a summary of the section as well as some key points. So if you read nothing else, those key points are really what you should be focusing on, but we're gonna you know, review some of those key points today. So I want to go on to sort of talk a little bit about each of the sections and you should be able to see my slides now. Um, so let's start with talking a little bit about the section that I co-led with Cynthia Xiao, uh, who's an adult gastroenterologist with an expertise in pregnancy and IBD. Uh, and that's the section on children with IBD and expectant, expectant mothers with IBD, as well as there's a section on seniors as well. Um, you know, the bottom line from this section is that children with IBD have more mild disease compared to adults with IBD and are less likely to require hospitalization which is consistent with what we see with the natural history of the disease in the general population. So even if you don't have IBD, children are generally less likely to get severe disease, although there are exceptions and we talk about some of the complications that children might have if they get COVID-19. Um, in the general population, pregnancy is associated with more severe COVID-19 uh, or birth complications like low birth weight and early delivery. However, the impact of COVID-19 in pregnant people with IBD isn't yet known. There's really a lack of science so far that looks at COVID-19 specifically in IBD patients to see if they're any different than in the general population. Similarly with seniors with IBD, as we've been stressing over the past year and a half, really seniors are the high risk groups if they get COVID-19 and that includes whether they, get, they have IBD or not. Certainly there are some medications that make seniors even more high risk, such as being on steroids or other immunosuppressants um, and being malnourished can cause a problem as well as having severe inflammation can cause a problem in seniors. But in general, seniors seem to have the same risk whether or not they have IBD. And so in general, vaccines are recommended in all these age groups because we've, searched, we've seen from real world evidence, as I'll mention, that, that vaccines are very highly effective at both preventing the disease and preventing complications of developing IBD. 
So let's talk a little bit about risk factors, medications, and mental health. So you've seen this all before, <laughs> probably from our second or third webinar. This is sort of the model that we've been following of trying to identify the people in the audience with IBD who are at the standard risk, uh, who should be following standard Public Health Agency of Canada guidelines. And, and those are really people who are under 65 and who are not taking immunosuppressive or biologic medicines and their IBD is in remission, they're not malnourished, and they have no comorbidities that put them at increased risk for developing IBD. Uh, so those people should be following the same public health guidelines as the general population because they're probably at the same risk of complications for COVID-19. Then we get into this medium risk category where we're not 100% sure. The secure IBD registry uh, you know, has indicated that people who are on immunosuppressives or biologics probably do about the same as people in the general population. Um, the exception might be azathioprine where you might be at more risk for severe COVID-19 or complications from COVID-19. But in that medium risk category, we basically urge people to be cautious, uh, you know, be a little bit more stringent than what public health guidelines are telling you to be. Uh, you may want to avoid in-person meetings. And even now in the day and age of vaccines, this is the group that may want to continue wearing masks indoors. Uh, because the Delta variant may uh, infect them more frequently because they're immunosuppressed. We really don't have any information about the Delta variant in this group of patients yet, but uh, you know, I think caution is uh, the smart thing to do. And then you have the high-risk groups. As I mentioned, the people over 65 or those who are under 65 who are on corticosteroids, so prednisone, methylprednisolone, hydrocortisone, and so on. Those people are certainly at increased risk for severe COVID-19, being hospitalized or potentially dying from COVID-19. Similarly, we know that having moderate to severe inflammation puts you at increased risk and being malnourished puts you at increased risk as well. So those are the people that for sure should be vaccinated, hopefully vaccinated already, but also should be extra cautious, perhaps not self-isolated now that you're vaccinated, but continue to wear a mask indoors. Um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've certainly identified uh, increasing distress and mental health concerns in patients with IBD. And that's been shown in children, adolescents, seniors, and pregnant people, both with uh, IBD and without IBD. And so that's been sort of the pandemic underlying the pandemic, as Dr. Graf and Dr. Bernstein will talk about in a bit. A lot of questions about vaccines and the future of vaccines and healthcare delivery, and this chapter will deal with that as well. Uh, you know, we've reviewed at length in previous webinars the different types of vaccines, the mRNA vaccines versus the adenovirus vaccines. Real world evidence suggests that the vaccines for COVID-19 are safe and effective and produce robust immune responses against SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 especially following two doses of the vaccines in people with IBD. So we know that being on a biologic or immunosuppressive agent, likely you have less of a robust antibody response after one dose, might not be zero, it might be zero, but it might not be zero. But after two responses, the studies like Clarity IBD are showing a very good antibody response against the virus that causes COVID-19. And so it seems like people with IBD will be protected after two doses. I wanted to focus just a little bit of new data. This is not in IBD patients, it's in the general population, but this is something that a lot of people have been asking about and, and are worried about, and that's the Delta variant and how well the vaccines work against the Delta variant. These are data from the UK. Uh, this is a bit of an older study that looked at how well the two types of vaccines, the Pfizer mRNA vaccine and the AstraZeneca adenovirus vector vaccine, how well they work to prevent COVID-19 in the alpha, which is the variant originally described from the UK versus the Delta variant, which is the more recent variant originally described in, from India. And you can see that after one dose, the vaccines are not as effective against the Delta variant, but after two doses in the general population, they seem to be very effective against the Delta variant, equally effective compared to the alpha variant. So that's very good news that it seems like people are protected against getting symptomatic COVID-19, meaning you know, getting the infections and developing symptoms. But even more importantly are these data that came from Public Health England a few weeks ago, which showed that yes, it's effective against symptomatic COVID-19, but these are the numbers for uh, being hospitalized with COVID-19. And in fact, after two doses, both the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine are equally effective against the alpha variant or the delta variant. 
So really that's the important number right here, 96 and 92% is that it's very, very, very protective. Even if you get the infection that you're not likely to be hospitalized for uh, COVID-19 because the vaccine is making it a more mild illness. So the bottom line here is there's very good hope to say that if you're vaccinated with two doses, we are gonna get out of this pandemic and you will hopefully get back to a normal life. And then, you know, this is sort of the chapter on the future, you know, what's happened in changing therapy and the future of changing therapy with COVID-19. And it's really necessitated alternate models of delivery of care, healthcare to those with IBD, including much more virtual care and remote monitoring of disease activity, uh, which will influence healthcare delivery models in the future, I think. I think we're not gonna go back to a day when every visit is in person. I think that we've learned that we can monitor most patients virtually. We can see you virtually with clinic visits. We can do fecal calprotectin, fecal calprotectin and blood work and other monitoring methods in order to make sure that you're, you're well and continue follow up virtually. Unless you know, there's any red flags and things are not going well, we certainly would wanna see you in person. But I think that there's going to be this drive in the future post-pandemic for increased virtual monitoring. So better ways of making sure you're well. And that could be with technologies like wearable technologies, mobile apps, and so on. Uh, things like uh, the MyGut app that, that Crohn's and Colitis Canada has, has developed, I think will we'll advance very quickly in order to be one of the mechanisms that uh, we are able to monitor you and make sure that you're well at home and not have to bring you to clinic visits every month or two months or six months. So in general, I think this, this report is really aimed at summarizing what we've learned over the last 15 months or so, and really producing you know, um, an impetus for you know, really driving things forward and moving beyond this pandemic, but not forgetting the things we learned over the past 15 months. I think we've learned a lot about how the virus interacts with inflammation and with steroids. I think we've learned a lot about um, vaccines in IBD patients and perhaps how biologics influence vaccine response. And I think we've learned a lot about remote monitoring and virtual care. And none of those things are gonna be thrown out the window after this pandemic is done. We're gonna take all of that information and build to the next level so that we can treat you better and that your quality of care improves going forward. And with that, I, I wanna introduce the panelists. Uh, and you can turn on your webcams as you're introduced. I'll go pretty quickly, but uh, to start, we've got Dr. Leslie Graff, uh, who's been on this webinar many times before. She's a clinical health psychologist at University of Manitoba. Dr. Charles Bernstein, who's a distinguished professor of medicine and head of the section of gastroenterology and program director and director of the IBD Center and very well known at the University of Manitoba. Uh, Dr. Ellen Kunzig, who's a senior research associate here at SickKids with me and an epidemiologist, as well as a patient with IBD. Uh, and Dr. Cynthia Xiao, who I think has not quite joined us yet, but will a little bit later, who is an adult gastroenterologist and specialist in pregnancy with IBD at the University of Calgary. Dr. Laura Tagovnik, who's an associate professor of medicine and division director of gastroenterology at University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Deanna Gibson, uh, who's an associate professor of biology at University of British Columbia. D uh, Dr. Joey Ritt Windsor, who's a research associate uh, in the Faculty of Medicine at University of Calgary with Dr. Kaplan. Dr. Sanjay Murthy, who's now an associate professor of medicine. Actually, congratulations, Sanjay, that just came in last week. Uh, so that's fantastic news. He's now an associate professor of medicine at the University of Ottawa and the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. And uh, Dr. Stephanie Coward, another research associate and an epidemiologist uh, in Dr. Kaplan's lab. And so you can all turn on your uh, webcams if you so desire. Um, but so this, these are sort of the, the first questions and I think really aimed at Dr. Kunzig, Ellen. Uh, because she was so instrumental and essential in designing the methods to develop this report. Ellen, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the methods that you use to create this policy report and, and sort of corral all the evidence? And then can you tell us a little bit about from your perspective, both as a scientist and as a person living with IBD, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on your world and on the IBD patient population in general that you can see? Uh, Ellen, are you there? Oh, just uh, on mute. Yeah. 
rookie mistake that I shouldn't be making after how long? <laughs> 15 months. Yeah, I know. Exactly. No worries. Um, so start off thanking uh, Eric and Gil for the opportunity and invitation to corral um, all of the evidence and all of the scientists and gastroenterologists and everyone who's involved in work in uh, we're writing this report and putting it all together. Um, so we started off as a steering committee, originally planning to update the 2018 version of the impact report, which was looking at life pre-pandemic and how that, how the impact of IBD in a world where the pandemic didn't exist. But then um, with the pandemic, clearly nothing else really mattered nearly as much as the impact of COVID-19 on IBD patients. So we pivoted to um, focus on COVID specifically and its impact. And as Gil mentioned, we have a hundred page report. Um, so there clearly is a lot of information and a lot of science that has happened over the last year. Um, so as a steering committee, we identified experts in all of the different areas um, that were mentioned in each um, chapter or section of the report was put together by experts in those fields. Um, people who are knowledgeable on mental health, like Leslie Graff, um, pediatric experts like um, Eric and Ann Griffiths um, really did a great job on that chapter. Um, Cynthia Siao on pregnancy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can't name everyone. You'll hear from them all later. Um, and what we did to channel all of the science that has happened is we did what's called a systematic review. So when people publish scientific papers, they get deposited into various databases. Um, so every journal article is in one of these databases. Um, you, PubMed is one that's pretty common and you might've heard of. Um, there was also databases that were specifically designed to capture research on COVID-19. Um, so one of those was created by the WHO and that's another database that we searched. So we created a very broad search strategy. So we used um, words like COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, and any synonym that we could think of that would potentially be used in a paper on COVID-19. And we combined those with paper or with terms like inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and words that you would um, typically associate with IBD. And we looked at how many of those papers were published and there was a massive number. And we had some IBD fellows who are IBD physicians in training um, go through all of the papers. I forget how many exactly there were, but there were thousands that they went through um, on their evenings and weekends and kind of curated everything um, based on themes. So all of the epidemiology papers went to Dr. Coward and the epidemiology team, anything on pediatrics went to um, Eric and his team. Um, and so everyone got the latest evidence that we could possibly find. And then we, um, after we finished the report and as everyone was writing, we continued to kind of look for articles. Um, so, and because everything is involved so rapidly, vaccines being one topic that the evidence is, there's new evidence every day. So we were constantly trying to keep everyone up to date on, to make sure that the report had the latest information um, and make the report as comprehensive as we possibly could. Um, and then the working groups put together each of the chapters um, and then all the chapters have gone through pretty extensive editing um, and Dr. Windsor is going to be on a little bit later, did a fantastic job of translating everything from scientific knowledge to make it much more of an accessible report um, into the version that is on the Crohn's and Colitis Canada website today. Um, and then thinking about the impact of COVID-19 on IBD as a scientist, it was incredible to see how many people pivoted their research programs so quickly and so much collaboration and cooperation around the globe, really, when you think about things like the secure IBD registry that have been presented, 
the amount of work and um, dedication that people have put into creating those databases, doing the research on the, um, the data that's been accumulated in those databases, and even to everyone around the world who has been um, providing information on their patients who have contracted COVID-19. It's been a colossal effort to get all of that data. Um, and it's been so incredibly important to inform um, physicians, IBD patients, everyone about what the impact of COVID-19 really is on IBD patients and what are factors that increase risk. Um, but when we were coming to working on the report, one thing that kind of struck me, there's also a lack of evidence in some areas. Um, we mentioned, um, or Eric mentioned um, pregnancy and in seniors, we don't really have lots of data on those aspects. Another um, question that has always been lingering in my mind and I haven't seen really any good data on this is what has the impact of IBD patients potentially being more adherent um, to public health guidelines how has that impacted the IBD population? And I know me personally compared to um, friends and family my age, I'm much more risk adverse. And um, even when uh, kind of between the December, January waves and the spring wave, I guess second and third wave that we had, um, I know lots of people were a lot more comfortable with the gatherings and opening ups um, than I was. And, you know, that's, it's been challenging and I know even still I am probably a little bit more hesitant about this the opening up than um, lots of people are. I know I'm getting lots of pressure from family to go out and travel this summer. You've, and, you've gotten two vaccines, right? Yes, that I've gotten should be two made vaccines. clear. You've definitely gotten two vaccines. So you're still anxious and, and hesitant. And that's a, the feeling that a lot of people get. There's no doubt. I want to actually just come back to something you just said about the impact of people, you know, IBD patients potentially staying home. There was a couple of studies through the last year that showed that IBD patients may be at lower risk from even getting COVID-19. And that, you know, that's the thought is maybe that's one of the reasons why is that they were protecting themselves more. You know, I wonder whether there's ever going to be a study that looked at the risk of, you know, middle-aged doctors of getting COVID-19. And I bet you they'll show that we're at lower risk of getting COVID-19 too, because we are more, you know, uh, we protected ourselves more. We were, took it, I guess we took it seriously uh, and we could stay home a lot um, if we didn't have to work in the emergency room and things like that. So we would be in a similar situation as the, the IBD patient, I think. And yeah, I think it's these, definitely, sorry, go ahead, Gil. Or I was, we just hope these, these webinars played a, a small part in helping the IBD community and having that knowledge and, and being able to, you know, follow the, the right guidelines and get the right information and, and do the things that they did. And and Ella, I just want to echo Eric's earlier comment. Thank you so much for everything that you've done and helping putting together this report. Uh, just for the audience, you, like the difference between a report that is kind of evidence-based versus opinion-based is, is to have a systematic approach to defining the literature that's feeding the information that goes into a report. And, and Ellen was chief among everyone in the, in the involvement report, making sure that we have the evidence to support this, as well as helping coordinate all the different pieces um, that kind of together over the past six months. And, um, and then on, on the flip side, you mentioned um, Joanna, who I want to invite kind of next to, to talk a little bit about the knowledge translation chapter. Um, and uh, the, the questions that we kind of um, posed to you was, uh, you know, how do you, how do you communicate the knowledge of COVID-19's impact on IBD during the pandemic? Um, how, how, what, and, and then for Joy, as everyone uh, knew, I kind of mentioned you earlier in my presentation, you have PhD in linguistics, you did a postdoc in knowledge translation, you've been doing working with CCC for, for so long, helping putting everything together. So I think it's so key to get your um, advice, not only as the editor of the report, um, but as someone who's been so involved with everything we've done that's PhD related. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll echo the earlier comments that uh, I am also very happy to have been involved. It was a, a great learning experience for me and I, I, great opportunity to, to work with the national team. My approach to knowledge translation is um, giving people all the possible information in an accessible format and importantly without watering down the science or watering down the information. So uh, Eric's already been talking about how it's accessible language 
Um, unfortunately, that's it's not always possible. When we get into the vaccine chapter, uh, it becomes very, very scientific. Uh, so rather than taking some of that information out, we, we tried to make sure all the definitions were there. Uh, there's lots of hyperlinks in the document. So if something doesn't make sense, you can click the hyperlink and go to the definition or go to an external resource. Um, and if that information is interesting to you, it's there, it's available. And if it makes you glaze over, you can flip the page and, and go on with, with more information that might be more relevant to your specific situation. And then the other strategy, rather than just putting everything in accessible language, is making sure the information is communicated through a wide variety of, of media. So we have the written word in the burden report that anyone can read at their leisure. Um, we had the webinars so they can hear these expert opinions uh, if they're an auditory learner. Um, we also tried to provide hopefully interesting and informative infographics both in the, the burden report and in the webinars so that visual information is there. And we tried to uh, put all the information on, on YouTube or on Crohn's and Colitis Canada's website. So if you weren't able to join us live for a webinar, uh, you could go back and watch or re-watch key pieces of information. And, and one of my biggest um, roles in all of the that is trying to find two to five minute segments in each of the sections of the live webinars to snip into small YouTube clips. So that if you're interested in um, what is the role of pregnancy and IBD and COVID and, and how do they interplay, you can search just that clip where, where Cynthia was talking about that information uh, and watch that five minute piece that's especially relevant to you or, or something else like that. So it was just, you know, CCC's knowledge translation strategy uh, played into my own philosophy on knowledge translation that it's just provide all the information, provide it in a variety of different ways and give people the tools to access the information the way they need to have it. Thank you. And, and for those uh, in the audience, um, to see the presentation that be given across these webinars, you see any like amazing um, slides, it's, it's all being Joey who's put them together for, for me as well as working with CCC on the brilliant infographics. Um, the other person that's been kind of behind the scenes doing a lot of number crunching for uh, all of the data that's being recorded on the webinar is Dr. Stephanie Coward, who uh, did a PhD in epidemiology at the University of Calgary um, and is working there uh, as well. And, and Stephanie led the section of the chapter um, looking at the epidemiology of, of COVID in Canada and the world and, and on the IBD population. And we just want you to come in and share with us kind of uh, your thoughts on the epidemiology and the impact of COVID um, in Canada and, and on the IBD community. So looking, I think this is one of the unfortunately most fun things I've gotten to do as an epidemiologist is watching data arrive and come to fruition in real time. Normally when we deal with data, it's old, it's been gathered, we don't get to see new data come forward. And so what uh, the governments of Canada gave us the ability to do was give us individual level data for every COVID case and what I ended up producing and got to look at was the trends of COVID within Canada, the hospitalizations, the ICU admissions, the death, the asymptomatic spread and all of those things, which was really interesting, especially when you look at some of the first uh, slides that I produced for some of those first webinars where you know, we had these really high hospitalization rates, we had high mortality and all those things and then Last night, as I was preparing for this webinar, I actually reran all of those statistics and I said, where are we now? What's changed? And it's drastic. It's, and that is what is so interesting is that now we're seeing, you know, a 16% mortality with the elderly population that I saw back, that we saw back in November is now down to about nine. So we're learning more and this data is allowing us to track it and look at it. Um, the other really interesting things that I've been able to do and we've done, especially within this report, 
is speak to and calculate what's called the RT or the reproductive rate of this disease. Now there's two different kind of terms that we use. We use the R0 and the RT. The R0 is if we did nothing, how fast would this disease spread? What is the average number of people one person would infect? So the R0 of COVID is about five, 5.7, which is nearly four times that of the flu. So left unchecked, we were in trouble. So what the RT shows us is how we're able to affect the transmission of this virus over time. And there are different factors that play into this. So a lot of different public health measures, you know, we start wearing masks, washing our hands, social dis or physical distancing, I should say. And one of the most important ones was the vaccinations is we're able to really modify that RT. And so to put that a bit into perspective, when an RT is less than one, we're going to see a decrease in the spread. When it's one, it's going to stable. One person infects one. It's just going to remain consistent. Now, when that number becomes above one, that's where we get into problems and we get into trouble really fast because we see the average number of people, especially within such large populations, increasing and increasing. So going to the report, there's actually a really nice figure that compares the RT with the incidence. And you can see just the tiny changes in that RT drastically change our incidence of COVID. So as an epidemiologist, getting to look at that, like I said, in real time was probably one of the most interesting things that I'll possibly ever get to do in my career. And I really hope I never get to do it again. <laughs> to be completely honest. We all do. Yeah. We all do, no offense. I think we're all a little done here. <laughs> yeah, and I, I wanna pick up on that point that you mentioned that the mortality rate has dropped uh, mm -hmm. so significantly. So do you wanna to talk to us about why you think that is? So I think it's, you know, not just the, our ability to accommodate and understand the transmission of the virus. So increased hand washing, mask use, um, it also, so November was before vaccinations. Now we're looking after vaccinations. And so this is a cohort that um, was the first to be vaccinated really. So that's probably, the, actually getting the disease for them is a lot lower as well. We're also better able to treat the disease. You know, when you look back into the beginning, I still remember everybody hypothesizing, well, maybe it's this medication will be our star in this one, but now we really have a better idea. And people are being a lot more cognizant of, you know, that those people that are more at risk. Absolutely. I think, I think vaccines have made a huge, I mean, I think originally the, the new treatments made a big difference and are making a big difference. Uh, we have good treatments now for COVID-19 if you catch it and if you're in hospital. But the vaccines have really made a huge difference because the, the new COVID-19, it's not the same as the one we had back in March, right? It's, it's more infectious and it's more deadly. This Delta variant is, is pretty awful, but becoming vaccinated really almost eliminates your risk. Nothing is ever perfect, but almost eliminates your risk of dying of COVID-19. So extremely important to get vaccinated. And it is really interesting to see some of the, I don't want to speak outside of my section of epidemiology, some of the vaccine literature that's been coming out and looking at, you know, mixing different, you know, Pfizer, Moderna, and all of those things and the safety around that. But I will leave that to the vaccine chapter. That is not mine. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll talk about um, that in a second. And Stephanie, just before we, we let you go, um, I just want to highlight to the audience that before the pandemic, Stephanie was actually involved with a number of public engagements explaining what epidemiology was. Um, and, and you did a, a number of lectures back when we could like gather in bars and in, in different like public forums. Um, and your epidemiology talks, remember I watched you talk about it, you always use the zombie apocalypse as your analogy. Uh, and just remembering some of those talks you had about RTs and things like that using the zombie apocalypse. It's very reminiscent to what we've been dealing with over the past year and all the work you did. So thank you so much for, for everything that you've done this past year. Sometimes I borderline regret choosing that as the topic, for example, at this point, but it became very important, especially with learning about all the different types of modeling and getting to use them now. I think uh, over the past God. year, over the past year, we've all become zombies at one point or another. <laughs> I think we've all felt that. And that's a good segue to the section on mental health, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, you know, I think uh, Dr. Graf and Dr. Bernstein, if you're on the line, you know, 
I'll tell you what I've observed over the past year. I think that almost all of us uh, have personally experienced in ourselves or our family members uh, issues with mental health, whether it's, it was anxiety or depression or, or similar mental health conditions. When it comes to my patients, I, I saw an interesting evolution because I saw at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, some of my patients, teenagers, uh, hated being kept home from school and really wanted to be with their friends. And I'd say that was probably the majority, but there was a, a good number of patients, not a small minority that actually felt pretty good about staying home and, and enjoyed the process of learning from home and doing the homeschooling. And, uh, you know, some of them, you know, were less anxious about having to go to school and perform every day and so on. I didn't see that towards the end of the pandemic by the third wave. I think everybody was done. Uh, even the patients who felt that they enjoyed being at home, they, they were like, uh, enough, we want to go out now, we want to see our friends. So what's your experience been on the mental health of Canadians through COVID-19 and how has IBD interacted with that change in mental health? Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. I mean, even your examples have hit on some good demonstrations, I think, of what the experience has been. First of all, this has been a very challenging time. And it's not just for one or two people or one area that, you know, if someone's hit by an earthquake, it's one area and then it's done. But this pandemic has affected all of us and not just Canadians, but of course across the world. And it's gone on and on and on. So understandably, the impact of that for people's mental health has been pretty significant. There's been really um, a high, much higher levels of stress when these um, aspects are measured across populations. We do see a really significant increase in stress and a significant increase in those more clinical experiences of mental health, like anxiety or depression. Uh, we also noticed there was an increase in substance use, which is usually a bit of a sign of, you know, trying to cope in a different way. And uh, so, but it very much depends on where things were in the, in the pandemic as well. So early months, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty um, and a lot of worry. And, uh, and then it was almost that, you know, as the restrictions would ease a bit, it would seem that some of that general stress level would ease. Um, but overall, you know, in some of the measurements taken with Canadians, we were seeing actually a continued level of elevated anxiety and depression. Um, in looking um, at some other countries, not because they're different, but just because they measured things a bit differently, we did actually see when you ask the same people over time, we were actually seeing some reduction of that stress and anxiety as we got um, many months into the pandemic. And what I think that really reflects is the resilience of people. We start to adapt to that new normal um, and figure out um, you know, how we can go with it. Uh, so I think those are some you know, key aspects that we, we all hit this challenge with lots of uh, uncertainty and worry and we didn't have our usual coping strategies. Like what would you do normally when something bad or difficult happens? You reach out to people, you connect with them. Um, and, uh, and so much of the way we would normally manage things was restricted, except liquor stores were open. <laughs> and so, you know, there, there's a, a little bit of a hint as to why maybe some of the substance use rates went up. Yeah. And Dr. Bernstein, how do you feel like uh, pa your patients with IBD coped uh, in terms of mental health through the year? Well, I don't know that I could um, generalize. I think obviously it was a mixed uh, bag. Some people cope very well and some people didn't cope so well. And I think that's just reflective of the general population. People with IBD do have an increased um, prevalence of having mental health disorders. And we do know that people with mental health disorders and IBD, uh, the mental health disorders can affect the outcomes of the IBD. Um, so it's really important to pay attention to mental health at all times, whether we're in a pandemic or not. Now, as Leslie's just uh, underscored, uh, during a time of such stress as a pandemic um, and the extra stressors of the social isolation, um, the uh, financial stressors, the workplace stressors that of all we've all experienced certainly can be um, make somebody who doesn't have a mental health disorder as an underlying problem develop one or make somebody who has an underlying mental health disorder um, exacerbated. Now in IBD, the added uh, stressors for patients were uh, trying to understand whether they, just by the virtue of having IBD, were at extra risk of getting COVID, 
Was their medication going to put them at extra risk? And uh, while we needed answers to those questions, it also created a stressor. And uh, the stress can be you know, very difficult. Um, and then the vaccine. So should I get a vaccine? When should I get a vaccine? Do I have to adjust my medication scheduling if I'm going to get a vaccine? Is it going to be safe? And if it's safe, as it is safe, and we should remind everybody that it is safe to get a vaccine whether you have IBD or not, and it is safe to get a vaccine regardless of the medications you're on. Um, the question is whether you'll respond like somebody who's not on medications. And we think that most patients do respond, although we're not quite sure, for instance, if you're on moderate or high doses of prednisone as an example. But I agree with what things have been said earlier. Everybody needs to get a vaccine. Uh, I'm not quite as optimistic as Eric that we're um, seeing the end of this because the Delta variant does worry me a lot. And you, everybody on the webinar should take the opportunity if they have friends or family who are planning to not get a vaccine to strongly encourage them to get a vaccine. I do this with every patient that I speak to. I talk to them about uh, if, they're, if they've had it, if they're not uh, having it, why they're not having it and try to convince them to have it. So um, I don't know, I'm not sure we ended on the, the, on the, the uh, with an answer about the question, but I wanted to get in that public service announcement. Absolutely. And one more public service announcement I actually want to get in is that yourself, Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Graff have been funded by Crohn's and Colitis Canada to look much more carefully at mental health in IBD patients through the PACE program. Do you want to say a few words about what you're going to be looking at? So the PACE program is a program Crohn's and Colitis started um, maybe five years ago, if I've got the actual duration correct, but uh, it, it, they provided funding to five centers um, in uh, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, at Mount Sinai, um, McGill, uh, and in Hamilton. Um, and the, fun the centers were going to use the their, that funding to enhance the delivery of care uh, for patients with IBD. Uh, Crohn's and Colitis Canada put out a request for applications to uh, find a way to improve uh, clinic um, provision of care from the perspective of mental health and also nutrition. So that really uh, was right up mine. And Leslie's Alley, we've been uh, trying to do that together for uh, probably over 20 years now, and we have a strong interest in that. And so uh, we're developing a program with our um, clinic and clinic population where we're going to not just provide the same mental health care to everybody, but to find out what patients need. Some patients need help with anxiety. Some patients need just help with enhancing their resilience. Um, they're not having anxiety, they're not having depression, but they have a new diagnosis of IBD and they need to learn some uh, uh, ways to enhance their resilience to deal with new stressful situations. And similarly with nutrition, uh, there isn't a one size fits all. Some patients with IBD wanna know what they should or shouldn't eat but other patients are obese and just want to learn how to lose weight and eat a well-balanced diet. And other patients are undernourished and need to learn how to enhance their nutrition. So with Kathy Vianos, who's our research dietitian, who's also been with us for a number of years, we're hopefully going to get this rolling. Um, this summer, we, we've had a lot of documentation uh, already set forth. We're just waiting for our research ethics board to give us the final approval and then we can get rolling. If I can just add to that, that uh, we'll be talking a bit later in this webinar about de delivery of healthcare. But, uh, you know, in this uh, project, we're aiming to really utilize um, ways to connect virtually. I mean, Manitobans, where we're first focusing this, uh, are fairly spread out across the province. And so that for everyone to have to travel to Winnipeg um, is prohibitive sometimes at the best of times. So just really utilizing ways to do online screening around what people need and where they're at and then potentially deliver that care virtually is another aspect of this. And the one thing I would just add for the audience, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, and if I can also add that plug for the vaccine, you know, when we think about uncertainty and fear and worry, one of the aspects that really uh, counters that is looking at what you can control and what you can do that's going to help to keep you safe. And so, uh, you know, the vaccine is a very, obvious um, step for that around something you can do that's going to help you and your family. Thank you. And just for the audience, um, Dr. Graf and Dr. Bernstein's team that looks at mental health, particularly in, in IBD, uh, is the 
is the, one of the best um, research groups in the entire world uh, looking at this topic area. So we are so fortunate in Canada uh, the two of you and, and everyone at the University of Manitoba who's working in this in this discipline because you've advanced this field dramatically. Thank you. And, and, and thank you. another, um, sorry. No, I just said thanks. It's lovely of you to say. Well, and, and the, the other thing that University of Manitoba is known for is pharmacoepidemiology, like the study of how drugs have impacted um, the IBD community. Uh, and um, one of like the key pharmacoepidemiologists in Canada is, who has studied uh, this is Dr. Laura Turganowick, who started at University of Manitoba and uh, in the last uh, few years has moved to uh, the University of Toronto. And I just want to invite uh, Laura to talk about your section, your chapter uh, in the COVID IBD impact report, looking at the impact of risk factors in the IBD community and particularly the impact of drugs uh, as a risk of more severe COVID-19. And Laura, you're just uh, a perfect. Yeah. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Menchmal. Um, yeah, and uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, and the honor of serving on the task force uh, um, throughout the past eighteen months, as well as for the um, uh, as, as well as for the uh, for the opportunity to be involved in term, in writing the section of the impact of IBD or of COVID on IBD report. And for the and to serve the IBD community of Canada, so um, you know what I guess what what um, you know we wanted to talk about was sort of how we got to, um, um, sort of how we how we uh, developed the, um, uh, the the schema by which we determined sort of the risk, or, or but by which we determined uh, what might put patients who have IBD at higher risk, not only of catching COVID-19, but specifically of developing the more severe forms of COVID-19 that would require hospitalization, uh, result in a stay in the intensive care unit, or in worst case scenarios, result in death. So this of course started very early on with the emergence of COVID-19. And at the time, uh, there was a, a high level of concern uh, about, first of all, does IBD itself carry with it an increased risk of developing these more severe forms of, uh, these more severe manifestations of COVID-19. As we know, um, inflammatory bowel disease is a disease that uh, results from dysregulation or uh, sort of malfunction of the immune system. And it, uh, it stands to reason that in a disease that is mediated through the immune system, that any condition, any, that uh, um, any severe infection, that this disease might put you at higher risk, for developing severe infection. And then the second consideration is because a large uh, proportion of our patients with inflammatory bowel disease are using medications that try that through their action and the way we control inflammation is by suppressing uh, certain aspects of the immune system, whether these medications would in and of themselves increase the risk of developing more severe manifestations of COVID-19. Um, in any area where there's uncertainty, and of course there was a lot of uncertainty at the beginning, um, there was also concern that in the absence of strong evidence or, or strong guidance, that patients and physicians would make decisions that may result in changes to people's medications, and these could be medications that had been working very effectively over a long period of time. And so we were also concerned about the consequence of what would happen if people stopped the uh, medications be out of fear of developing COVID-19 and what would the impact be of that on inflammatory bowel disease. So thankfully, um, the uh, World IBD community came together very quickly um, in the early phase of the pandemic to develop, uh, I mean, to develop a strategy for how we are going to assess First of all, whether patients with IBD were at increased risk for, uh, for, for developing more severe manifestations of COVID-19. And second, were these medic how did the medic your use of medications affect uh, your risk of developing COVID-19? And so um, uh, the way this was done by, was by developing an international registry. Um, and this was led by a couple of, of American doctors, Dr. Ryan Angaru and Dr. Erica Brenner, but with participation from physicians around the world. Uh, Dr. Kaplan was a, 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 had some major involvement, as well as, a, as, well as a Dr. Coward and I believe Dr. Windsor um, in, in, in helping to, to both 
uh, create a strategy for helping physicians register patients who developed an inflammatory bowel disease, as well as some characteristics about those patients, we could determine what about those patients would increase the risk of IBD. And this got well publicized around the world and was able to enroll eventually thousands of patients over time. And what we were eventually able to learn from this registry and was later confirmed with, with subsequent research is that thankfully the medications that people were most concerned about, specifically the biologic agents, do not, in most circumstances, appear to increase the risk of developing COVID, severe manifestations of COVID-19. And that the main risks of developing COVID-19 were the same risk that you would see in the general population. In other words, that having IBD on its own did not appear, in most cases, to increase the risk of inflammatory bowel disease. So if you had IBD and you were over 80, or if you had IBD and you had significant heart disease or lung disease, you may be at increased risk, but just having IBD on its own did not appear to increase your risk. Now, this comes with several uh, caveats. The one medication that does appear to be fairly consistently associated with, ele with an elevated risk is the use of corticosteroids. So these are medications like prednisone. Now, whether this is from the prednisone itself or the fact that when people are in a situation where they're using prednisone, it, they probably have more severe active symptoms of their disease. It's unclear whether the risk factors driven by the prednisone or the underlying disease. In addition, there was a signal that people who are using immunomodulators, specifically azathioprine, particularly and, and whether on its own or in combination with, uh, with a biologic, particularly the anti-TNFs like infliximab or Remicade, uh, adalimumab or Humira, uh, that, that may also potentially increase the risk of severe infection. Now, I wanna keep in mind that these risks are still quite small on an absolute level. So even with the, they may increase your risk, let's say about of two times to four times, the risk of infection um, tends to be fairly low for most, or, or developing severe infection tends to be low for most people in the absence of other risk factors like age or severe heart and lung disease as examples. Um, so, at this point, you know, um, what uh, this gave physicians a, a fair degree of confidence not to make abrupt changes to people's medical therapy, just out of concern that they may be at increased risk of COVID-19. At the same time, it does give physicians some caution, particularly if you have some active symptoms and there's consideration about whether you should prescribe something like a corticosteroid. We, are, we were led, uh, advising physicians to just give thought as to whether that medication was really necessary and if there were potentially other ways to manage that. Um, um, as we move into the current day, as we go through sort of a, a more of a bit of a lull in terms of infection rates as vaccinations have taken hold and the incidence rates or the, the, pre, the amount of COVID-19 that's circulating in the community tends to be lower. Of course, the risk of any one person getting an infection is lower. And it still remains our advice that most for the vast majority of patients should not be making any major changes to their medical therapy out of fear of COVID-19. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Laura. I mean, I think that that's, it, you know, generally a very encouraging message, right, over, that we've learned over the past 15 months that we were worried. And I think Gil and I had spoken about that, uh, you know, in March 2020, we were concerned that we would be getting a lot of IBD patients who either had to stop therapy because they might die from COVID-19 or would die from COVID-19. And we didn't see that, which is really fantastic news. Um, you know, the steroid question is still a big, a big issue. And I think we've learned to deal with that. It's, you know, we're still using steroids, but it's, um, you know, we're more careful, I think, as the rates went up. But now with the vaccine and, you know, rates going down, I think we're, you know, we're encouraged that we can go back to a safe model of care and COVID-19 isn't the first thing, the top thing on our mind when we're thinking about treating, uh, treating patients well um, with further IBD. So I'm going to go back to Dr. Bernstein now uh, for a, a few minutes just and talk about seniors with IBD. And Ellen had mentioned a little bit earlier in the talk that this was one of the gaps in the literature that really there wasn't a lot of research regarding uh, IBD specifically, IBD patients and COVID-19 in seniors. Do you want to speak a little bit about how COVID-19 has impacted seniors with IBD? Sure. Um, 
we've come to learn that the highest risk for having an adverse outcome with COVID-19 is being a senior. Um, and, uh, and again, with our concerns with the Delta variant, that age of risk has slowly crept down. I think in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the greatest risk uh, for death was in people over the age of 65. And as one got older, the risk was even greater. And we saw these horrible outcomes in, in uh, personal care homes and nursing homes. Um, with the Delta variant, we're even seeing uh, deaths amongst younger people, but still with the Delta variant, the greatest risk are amongst seniors. Fortunately, by the time the Delta variant became a, um, a bigger problem, um, the, uh, the many of the seniors uh, were vaccinated, uh, thankfully. Um, another important risk for a bad outcome from COVID-19 uh, is having comorbidities regardless of your age. And of course, the older we are, the more comorbidities we're going to have. And so seniors are that population with more comorbidities. So what I mean by comorbidities is having other disease processes. So the older we are, we're more likely to have diabetes. We're more likely to have heart disease. We're more likely to have underlying lung disease. And these are risk factors for having bad outcomes with uh, COVID. So our seniors were certainly at risk and they have been at risk and we've seen uh, the risks uh, bear out uh, particularly uh, in personal care homes, but also amongst our loved ones uh, in our community who some of whom were otherwise uh, quite well, but just happened to be older and they just uh, didn't do as well. Now, having IBD and being a senior didn't put anybody at any greater risk than just being a senior without IBD. Um, so I think the IBD community can at least take some solace that having IBD uh, wasn't necessarily increasing their risk. Uh, two things uh, to point out, uh, I think, to end my uh, little blurb about seniors is number one, many of us, if not all of us, have gone to telehealth in some way of providing care. Uh, in fact, my clinics are almost exclusively on the phone now. Uh, many of my colleagues are using a combination of phone and video uh, link, but I'm having very few in-person visits. That is going to open up. I think there's a lot to be said about sitting across from a patient or sitting across from your doctor and looking them in the eye and talking about what's going on, especially if you're a new patient. But nonetheless, I think the phone visits have been a great boon for seniors, especially who have difficulty sometimes getting around, getting uh, rides to their visits, um, getting access. Um, if they have to wait for me for an extra hour rather than waiting in a clinic, uh, languishing, they're at home. And uh, and then if my phone call is a bit late, it's it's really not as uh, as difficult because they are comfortable at home. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that our governments are going to continue uh, to allow us to have a phone type of uh, contact or a video type of contact with patients because even beyond the pandemic, it's clearly uh, quite a help. And especially Leslie was alluding to uh, patients at a distance. Um, we all practice where we see patients that are not you know, coming to us from outside of our, our, our urban areas. The last point I would make is that uh, we've come to learn from flu vaccine that uh, while the flu vaccine may not be quite as effective in seniors as, as it is in young people, it's very effective in seniors and that it does decrease the rate of death from flu. And so once again, um, we need all of our seniors to be vaccinated because um, uh, they'll do much better against COVID if they're vaccinated than not. Thank you. And, and just for the, the audience, I just want you to know that if there's any like IBD clinician who doesn't have gray hair, uh, they have been mentored by Dr. Charles Bernstein. Um, I know myself and definitely Eric as well um, has had Charles as being an ally and a guide and a mentor throughout our careers. Um, and it's been such a huge privilege to work with you uh, on this task force and on this report. So I just wanted to thank you for everything you've done this past year plus the past 10 years of our careers. It's been my pleasure. Thanks. And to flip to a completely different age group, children um, now have the privilege of um, asking one of the world's most eminent pediatric gastroenterologists in the area of inflammatory bowel disease, um, what the impact of COVID-19 has been on children and their families. 
Yeah, well, so I, I wouldn't call me that if you're talking about me, but I was mentored by Dr. Griffiths and Dr. Mack, both of whom sat on this task force and helped with this report as well. So uh, I owe a lot of what I've learned and a lot of the work on this chapter to them. Um, you know, I think the, the impact on children has been interesting. They generally did well if they got COVID-19, and that included if they had IBD. You know, again, the one risk factor that seemed to consistently uh, be associated with worse outcomes was being on steroids. So we told families, you know, if your child is on steroids or has severe inflammation, they should probably stay home from school and they should uh, protect themselves and your family members should protect themselves. So that really goes for now as well, right? A lot of children cannot be vaccinated, right? The vaccines are approved for children 12 and up for the Pfizer vaccine and hopefully soon for the Moderna vaccine. But, um, you know, if you have a child with IBD who has active inflammation and they're under 12 and can't get vaccinated or they're on steroids, family members around them need to protect them. And that means the family members around them should be vaccinated. So please get your vaccine if I haven't said that enough. Um, but in general, I think the bigger issue in children with IBD has been mental health. Uh, you know, I think both in the children and their parents. You know, so at the beginning of the pandemic, parents were very, very anxious of what the implications of COVID-19 might be on their child. And again, it turned out to be, you know, a better case scenario than what we uh, expected to see at the beginning where, where children do very well. But then we had to deal with the children who were staying home from school, were forced to stay home from school and couldn't see their friends and couldn't play outside, uh, sometimes with, you know, play parks closed, unfortunately, by governments in, in uh, ill-fitting decisions, unfortunately. So we were then dealing with, you know, anxiety and depression in the kids with IBD who are at risk already for anxiety and depression uh, related to having a chronic disease. So, you know, we shifted gears from being afraid that they may you know, get very sick with COVID-19 to being afraid that they would get very sick with mental health issues. And, you know, we did our best to try to support those kids. But unfortunately, the mental health care system in Canada, you know, really needs to be improved quite a bit. And, you know, we struggled to keep up with, we, we were fortunate in Toronto to have, and in Ottawa when I worked there, to have excellent mental health support, excellent psychologists and psychiatrists who were interested in children with IBD and worked with the IBD centers to try to improve their mental health. But many centers, you know, many, many clinics and, and places across the country didn't have access to those specialists. So, you know, if I could send a message to anyone, if there's anybody in the audience who's a politician or a policymaker or has access to those people, my message would be, please help kids with their mental health. Please improve the funding to our mental health system because I think COVID-19 un uncovered a tremendous gap in you know our ability to care for these kids and we're losing kids to mental health problems unfortunately so uh, i think this needs to change and once we're out of this pandemic i really hope it's a wake-up call for policymakers. And, and eric my 13 year old max actually got his second vaccine yesterday um we had to drive out to vamp to uh, get him vaccinated but, um, but my 10 year old simon's and seven year old sarah haven't been vaccinated what do you think there's what's going to be like in the fall yeah, I'm super grateful that my older two kids, Megan and Noah, both got vaccinated with their second doses on Saturday. So super happy about that. But my youngest, Eden, also couldn't get vaccinated because she's just under. She was born in 2010. Uh, so I think that we will be giving it to children. Uh, you know, that's what I believe. But I think what we, ha we have to do is we have to wait for the trials. And the trials uh, for younger children under 12 will likely be out in September for the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. The AstraZeneca vaccine trial in children was put on hold uh, because of that risk of blood clots that we've talked about at length. But I think that likelihood is that, you know, Pfizer and Moderna will probably turn out to be both safe and effective in younger children. And I think that we will end up vaccinating those children because we really want to prevent them from getting sick, obviously, of COVID-19, but also spreading it, you know, if they catch the Delta variant, spreading it to somebody who might be at risk, like another immunosuppressed person. Uh, in the community. So I think that's probably what we're going to be doing, but we just have to wait a little bit longer. Probably September, the trials will be out and then Health Canada will assess things and probably approve things in October, but it's going to be a bit of a wait. Yeah, and then um, my colleague and friend, Dr. Cynthia Sio, who's a IBD expert at the University of Calgary, uh, who goes around the world when she was allowed to go around the world, um, talking about the impact of um, being an expectant mother with IBD and has been a huge member of the task force helping us navigate a really difficult area if you happen to be pregnant with IBD during the pandemic. And Cynthia, 
what, what have we learned about um, pregnancy and, I, and IBD in COVID? Oh, thanks uh, to CCC, Dr. Benchamore, Dr. Kaplan, my colleagues, and the rest of the task force for this opportunity to be involved with this task force. It's been phenomenal. So I just want to say a few things about COVID-19 and pregnancy first. Um, and really, we have been really concerned for our expectant mothers. We know from the general data, so that means mothers who may not have IBD, that when they do get sick with COVID-19, that they do have worse outcomes. That these worse outcomes include the risk of um, going to the intensive care unit, requiring mechanical ventilation to help these women breathe, which is really very, very scary if they're pregnant, and then other adverse outcomes on the baby. And that's what most mums are worried about the most, right, is what happens to the baby. And unfortunately, if you do have severe COVID-19, the, there is an increased risk of stillbirth, so the baby's not being born live. There's also an increased risk of preterm birth, and that's defined by um, babies being born before 37 weeks. And the reason why we're always concerned about preterm birth is some people say, well, the baby just came a bit early. We said, no, when the baby comes early, they're just not so strong. They can't withstand the you know, rigors of the external world. So they're more likely to have in, um, infections themselves, um, COVID aside, and they're also at increased risk of long-term neurological complications. So really um, there are significant risks of COVID-19 in pregnant women, and those risks are for the woman themselves as well as for the babies. And so when you throw IBD into the mix, this becomes really concerning because um, just as COVID-19 is an additional illness, IBD is an additional illness. And so we've really, really emphasized to our mums that it's important to keep their disease under control. So that includes avoiding anything like COVID-19 by getting appropriately vaccinated, which we'll discuss in a little tick, um, using the other measures um, such as the physical distancing um, and wearing the masks, um, those are important factors, but also keeping the IBD under control. And as you've already heard from um, Dr. Tagalnik, that's particularly important because you don't want a mum to be pregnant and having a flare, having extra medications such as steroids, which can increase the risk of developing worsening COVID-19 and also make their pregnancy worse. So even though I've given you lots of bad news, I will tell you there's lots of good news on the horizon. And we have really learned that the COVID vaccine has been safe um, and really emphasize that safe as well as effective for pregnant women with, I, um, pregnant women with IBD and pregnant women without IBD. And the really good news is that the antibodies that the mum develops from the vaccine gets passed through to the baby. So we've just heard from Dr. Benchamol and from Dr. Kaplan that our kids um, often aren't in the age of, you know, to be able to receive the vaccine. I've got three kids under the age of 12, they can't receive the vaccine. And so when people say, well, what can I do to protect my kids? Well, if you're pregnant, you're lucky you're a step ahead. Um, if you get vaccinated as the mum, the antibodies travel in the breast milk. They also travel in the um, across the placenta. They're found in the umbilical blood and they're found in the baby. And the earlier you get vaccinated during that pregnancy, the higher the antibody levels are. So for the pregnant mums out there, just yet another reminder, we've all been telling you about the efficacy of vaccines. But the earlier you get the vaccine for that pregnant woman, wow, you're going to be at least nine months ahead, seven months ahead of all of our kids who haven't been able to get the vaccine yet. So really there is good news on the horizon and you know, mums can get vaccinated, their babies can be protected and soon there's only the baby to age 12 that need to be vaccinated. We hope there really will be good news um, in, in the near future. I think, and as we're talking about vaccines, it's probably a good time to pivot to the, the vaccine chapter of our report. Um, not only um, was the, we've had several webinars dedicated to, to the vaccines, and we know that this was something that was huge questions for the IBD community. And we've, we've had the, the privilege of having a number of different experts on our task force, including basic scientists and clinician experts as well. And, and the reason why it's so important to have both is 
the topic of vaccines, there's a tremendous amount of mechanistic trying to understand how vaccines work, why these mRNA vaccines are novel, why they're effective, all these types of things. And it was so important to have experts like Dr. Deanna Gibson, who's a basic scientist uh, who understands the microbiome and immunology and vaccines to help us kind of understand the, the mechanisms of this. And she was uh, key and instrumental in working with Dr. Sanjay Murthy, who's an eminent uh, clinical IBD epidemiologist to write the vaccine uh, section uh, of this report. And, and Deanna, maybe I can just start with you just asking you just to give us a, a general understanding of the impact of these vaccines on, on COVID-19 in in, uh, in in the general sense. So um, I think uh, we can all uh, agree that the only way out of the pandemic will be through vaccination for sure. And that's why we're starting to see the numbers decrease. Um, I do want to uh, point out that I, I'm sort of on the same page as Dr. Charles Bernstein that we're not quite out of the woods yet. And, and we do need to, to be a little bit concerned um, about opening up so quickly because um, we, can, we can see from the Israel data that um, even though they had 85% um, fully vaccinated individuals, that the Delta variant is breaking through in that population. And so while we will still be protected from very high, you know, very high levels of protection from mortality, which is great news, um, I think that what we can do is, is really encourage um, everybody around us to get vaccinated if they're not already. Um, in Canada, we're only at 70% with a single dose and double dose is only sitting at about 37%. So um, this is, you know, this is fantastic. We're going as fast as we can, but really until maybe 85% um, or even 90%, like measles with 95% where we have that number of individuals doubly vaccinated, there's still cause for concern. And that's because the way that a vaccine works is that of course we get individual immunity. So we all have the ability to produce what's called antibodies from B cells and we have cells that stick around. They're called memory cells in our bodies for very, very long periods of time, sometimes our entire life. So what, when we see the second time the virus, we have uh, a very quick response and we pump out millions of these antibodies that actually block the virus from getting into our cell. Um, but we rely on herd immunity to get ourselves out of the pandemic. So that is the herd, very large portion of the community that is immune to this disease. And that's where it makes the unlikely spread from person to person to happen when we have this high herd immunity. Um, and so, you know, it's really important that um, Canada and the rest of the world get vaccinated um, fully. I've read a lot of comments on the third dose, so I'll just comment on that right now quickly, that there is some evidence to support that immunosuppressed individuals getting a third dose would be beneficial. Um, maybe a third dose will be required for everybody, not just immunosuppressed individuals, but everybody. And it's also, I want to point out, very easy to modify the mRNA vaccine. So if the mRNA vaccine can be modified to directly attack the Delta variant, this would be a reasonably easy change to make in about six weeks period of time. So I think um, I have a lot of comfort knowing that um, perhaps we will need to get a third dose. And at this time, the third dose will be specific to that uh, Delta variant or any other variants that might pop up. I want to point out um, one quick thing that I didn't cover in the chapter. And that was, um, we didn't talk that much about the variants. Of course, variants, this is a very natural process for viruses to mutate. Um, their goal in life is just to propagate themselves and they will do whatever they need to do um, to, to, um, to, to, to basically survive. And so that's why we're sort of against the time, right? All of us have to get vaccinated as quickly as we can so that no more variants can pop up in unvaccinated communities which then leave us who are vaccinated at risk, maybe not for severe disease, but still for um, asymptomatic disease, which um, we know that can lead to long-term consequences as well. So it's, it's not that there could be no consequences with that. Um, yeah. So. Those are excellent points. And in fact, one of the things that we have to remember, this is a global pandemic. We are so fortunate to live in a country like Canada 
um, that has the access and the resources to allow its entire population to be vaccinated um, so early in the pandemic, but we recognize there's so many parts of the world that right now are have very low penetration to vaccination, and mainly because they don't have access to, va to vaccines. In that milieu, mutations can occur, and, and how we protect ourselves is by having that population who does have access to vaccine to, to go ahead and be vaccinated. Um, and Sanjay, I just want to kind of bring you into the conversation too, and just to ask you, you know, you had wrote a you know big part of the, the vaccine um, chapter was on the vaccines, how it works potentially differently in patients with IBD. And I just wanted to get your sense on, you know, what should IBD patients be thinking about in terms of the vaccine? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Gil. Uh, and so a lot, lot's been said about vaccines already. And uh, I think that uh, uh, fortunately, the, the news for IBD patients is, is good uh, on, on the vaccine front. So, you know, I, I think uh, just to, you know, make sure everyone's on the same page, you know, individuals with immune-mediated immune disease, including IBD, were not included in the pivotal trials that demonstrated efficacy of the vaccines that are now approved in Canada. But there has been a uh, plethora of evidence that has been emerging from different centers around the world, and in fact, international efforts to try to study vaccine efficacy in IBD patients. And I think there's two things to consider. One is safety, and the second is efficacy. And um, so what, what, what is emerging is that the safety profile of vaccines in IBD patients is really no different than the general population. And I think that's important to consider, um, even considering the fact that patients may have concerns of being on immunosuppressants and what does that mean in terms of what the vaccine will do to me. It's important to remember these are not live vaccines, they're not live attenuated vaccines. They're small snippets of genetic material coding for one part of the coronavirus. Uh, a, a, a very effective part for your body to recognize an attack, but in no way confers any susceptibility to infection with coronavirus. Uh, um, so, so that's important to, to remember. And, and so safety, uh, and, and of course, we've all heard of the emerging safety concerns relating to uh, blood clots with, with the um, AstraZeneca and Janssen vaccines, and now myocarditis and pericarditis with the uh, mRNA-based vaccines important to put these in context as being very rare uh, 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 adverse reactions and also no evidence to date to support that those re adverse reactions are any more common in IVD patients than on IVD patients. So I think the safety profile looks similar to what we see in the general population. And then on the effectiveness side of, of the vaccines, um, we have uh, uh, um, actually good, good emerging evidence from a number of different studies. Uh, a large U.S. Uh, study in the veteran affairs population with an almost 15,000 individuals who are, with IBD who are on a variety of treatments, many, many of whom are on biologic agents, um, and, and demonstrated that the individuals who had two doses of uh, an mRNA vaccine um, fared substantially better in terms of COVID-19 rates than IBD patients who did not get vaccinated. Uh, um, so that, that's one of the you know, premier lines of evidence so far that demonstrate that the rates of active infection with COVID-19 have uh, decreased substantially with vaccination amongst IBD patients. Um, you know, there's a large international uh, effort uh, um, known as the Icarus IBD uh, cohort where they're prospectively collecting data on IBD patients where they've released some preliminary data um, from uh, vaccinated individuals showing that uh, in persons who are on biologics such as anti-TNF agents like infliximab or uh, uh, vetalizumab uh, do have robust immune responses after receiving two doses of, of the vaccine. Um, similar, uh, a little less robust than perhaps individuals who don't have IBD or uh, uh, so they have control populations of healthcare workers and uh, other healthy controls who have slightly higher immune responses, but nevertheless, the immune responses generated in the IBD population to two doses of the vaccine uh, were robust enough uh, uh, to be considered protective. Um, but what has equally emerged in that, in that series in the Sikoros population, as well as in the Clarity IBD population, is that there appears to be reduced uh, development of antibodies after a single dose of vaccine, specifically among in individuals who are on uh, uh, certain types of immunosuppression, uh, particularly anti-TNF biologic agents, such as Remicade, Humira, or, the, or their biosimilars. Um, and uh, conventional immunosuppressant agents, such as steroids or azathioprine or methotrexate. Um, and 
while it's not entirely clear what the uh, impact is in terms of COVID-19 infection, um, the, the, the presumption is that that reduced rate of antibody formation after the single dose could confer increased risk to, to active infection. So I think the message there, which is now echoed by Crohn's and Colitis Canada, also by the National Advisory uh, uh, in, Ca in Canada, is that um, it's important to get that second dose and ideally to get that second dose in as quick a time as possible, ideally no later than what was done in the trials, which was three weeks for the Pfizer vaccine, four weeks for the uh, Moderna vaccine. Um, and so I think those are the specific factors that are relevant to the IBD population. I think the overall outlook is very good. And I think that there is no justifiable reason to not consider vaccination if you're an IBD patient, whether you are or not on immunosuppressive therapy. So Sanjay, there's a question in the, in the Q&A uh, that I think we need to address. Well, through all of these fairly large cohorts now that are looking at vaccine effectiveness in patients with IBD, around the world, has there been any signal that the vaccine causes flare-ups of their IBD? If somebody's in remission and they get the vaccine or not in remission and get their vaccine, are they going to get worse IBD as a result? Um, I'm not aware of any data showing that. Uh, uh, certainly, if anyone else is, uh, please speak up. Um, I, I think this is a targeted immune response against a specific protein molecule um, that is uh, present on the coronavirus uh, uh, um, in the coronavirus uh, 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 virus, and there's no real reason to suspect that simply generating an immune response against that is all of a sudden going to flare up an immune response against the bowel. So uh, theoretically, I don't think that that would be something to worry about. Uh, I don't know if there's been any evidence to, to suggest that. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I think, um, I'm sure Deanna, I don't know if you want to chime in, do, do you sort of, you agree biologically that it doesn't seem plausible that it would cause a flare-up of IBD? <laughs> I mean, theoretically, I, I suppose it, uh, Sanjay is right. Um, but as a scientist, anything is possible. And, and we do know that um, with the spike protein, there there is some potential for um, autoimmune responses to, to happen, um, which might explain the things like thrombosis or, or even um, myocarditis, um, very, very rarely, right? So um, I don't think there's any evidence to support that. I agree with um, that, Sandra, it's unlikely, um, but all things are possible too. Uh, Eric, can I make a comment? Sure, absolutely, Dr. Bernstein. So uh, uh, unequivocally, um, in the last uh, six months, I've had uh, some patients who, and, and it's been very uncommon, but patients who were well got a vaccine and were became unwell, which what they thought was a flare of their IBD for a short period. I've not experienced patients having sort of a flare that becomes inexorable and, and um, carries on, uh, but I have, uh, and I believe them, these are reliable patients. Now, anything can happen and without data for, for, for the lay public, you know, joining us tonight, you know, things can happen just by chance. And so without actually studying it properly, it could be that the, you know, three to five patients I had tell me this, you know, they might have had some kind of acute diarrheal illness that just happened. And the only way to know would be to look at hundreds of people who got the vaccine and hundreds of people who didn't. But nonetheless, I have had a handful of patients tell me they've unequivocally flared, although the flares did not sort of persist for weeks or months. They stayed on their medication, things settled down. So there seems to be in some way that the, it's mostly been a diarrheal related problem. Um, they weren't, so I, I agree with Deanna that, that um, you know, scientifically reactions can be triggered and perhaps in some IBD patients the, the, the physical or clinical response has been some diarrhea. In, in un, unequivocally, the vast majority do not, and I've spoken to, without exaggerating, hundreds of patients now who've had vaccines, and it should not be a reason to not get vaccinated, to be afraid that your disease will flare, because if it, if it happens, it's quite uncommon. Yeah, and I would say you're balancing the risk of potentially maybe some more symptoms, which even that we're not sure about, with the risk of complications from COVID-19. 
Uh, and like Dr. Bernstein said, if there are symptoms, we may be able to settle things down or it settles down on its own. Just want to note that we, we did a study way back now in 2014 in children in Ontario, because that was the rumor that was going around about the flu vaccine, that it might cause flare-ups of IBD. And we did a study in all the children in Ontario, and we found that in years where they got their flu shot compared to years where they didn't get their flu shot, they actually had a lower risk of seeing their doctor for IBD related reasons, no difference in hospitalization rates. So, you know, in fact, it seemed like they were better off in years where they got their flu shot. So clearly we have to do a similar type of study with COVID-19 vaccine. I think that's something that has to be done and more data is going to come out, but all of these, you know, these rumors that vaccines might cause flare ups of IBD and they've done this in other vaccines as well have not, sort of come to pass. It, it doesn't seem like it's happened so far. So, you know, data to come, but so far it seems like it's safe and highly recommended to prevent complications of COVID-19. And I would quickly just add, I, I have a, we, we set up a COVID-19 clinic at University of Recovery that I'm a member of. And you know, so I've seen a lot of people who have IV who've gotten COVID uh, and almost everyone who's gotten COVID has had to held their medication while they're acutely ill from COVID. Um, and many of them, because of holding their medication, um, have then went on to have issues with, with IBD flares like that. So it's again, you, it's, everything has to be balanced against very, very small risk of uh, you know, theoretical risk of flaring, which I, I don't think there's any data to support at this time. But if you were to get COVID and you have to hold your medication, and now, there, now there's a substantial high risk of having a flare because you, you have to stop your therapy while you're sick. Yeah, and I, I just want to I just want to point out, uh, you know, vaccinations aren't perfect. They are man-made uh, or woman-made or or what have you. They're they're made by humans, and um, we don't understand everything entirely about immunology. We've learned so much about the immune response. We might have to rewrite textbooks just based on what happened with COVID. So it is a young field, but it's really important to weigh the risks and the benefits. There, even if there was a flare and it was my child who had IBD, I would still get them vaccinated because there is no other way out of the pandemic. And when you get vaccinated, you're not just protecting yourself, you are protecting everyone around you. So that's how important it is. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so let's move on now to just talk about differences, changes in the healthcare delivery system and close off with that sort of uh, question. You know, So really aimed at some of the clinicians that we have on our panel, Dr. Murthy, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. Xiao, Dr. Zagarnik, and Dr. Graf. How did delivery of healthcare change through the pandemic and how do you see it changing after the pandemic? Do you have anyone specific? You're no, I, so I'm I, opening it up. Go right ahead, Sandra. Um, well, I, I think um, everyone has sort of similar experience here that um, really, you know, nobody liked anything about the pandemic, but if there was a silver lining to the pandemic is it, that it ushered in this race to improve technology and the ability to offer remote care, um, which we've all known for a long time could be helpful. Uh, especially for patients, but also for us in our practices. Um, and, and, and this has really brought that to the forefront. And, you know, we've seen substantial improvements in integration of virtual care software into our EMRs, for example, and just in terms of workflow and being able to provide care virtually for, for patients. So I, I think, obviously, you know, this has been the, the biggest transition um, from what we traditionally did, you know, historically, you know, everybody remembers the days, it wasn't that long ago when you got up early, 6 a.m., got ready, drove an hour to your doctor's hospital, searched for parking for about 20 minutes, um, you know, already started the day off on, on a bad foot there, um, then finally made your way into the hospital, spent another half an hour trying to register, then if you're lucky, you got to see your physician within an hour, um, because most of us are obviously trying to serve many people at the same time and are never able to keep time. Um, and then finally send you off to the lab and you're waiting another two hours. And, and so, you know, really it's a whole half day to a day commitment. Uh, and some individuals come in from, from hours away. And it, it always shocked me to, to, to learn 
where where some of my patients were coming from geographically and, and that they took the, the the effort to make it and that's really commendable but at the same time this has offered a whole new uh, uh, option for them to now you know be able to continue to function normally and do what they would be normally doing in their day and 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 still receive high quality care uh, via phone via zoom or uh, appointment um, and I think as a physician I, I have, have embraced that as well. Um, certainly, it, it allows flexibility in terms of when we can schedule appointments uh, for individuals to suit their timings and our timings as well. Uh, also, you know, if an individual is able to carry out his day-to-day -day routine, uh, his or her day-to-day -day routine, and, and you happen to be an hour late, they're not so disappointed. Uh, whereas making them wait an hour in the waiting area is just not not acceptable, really. So, um, you know, a lot, a lot of, lot of little things um, in terms of you know, uh, cost and time that, that, that makes, you know, virtual care that much more uh, attractive. And, and I think that um, really that's been the major switch here. Um, and, and with that is going to come increased development in, uh, in, into remote uh, monitoring technologies. We're already seeing the emergence of various IBD apps that can help with home monitoring. That's only going to grow. Uh, and, and I think this has really kind of changed the way we're going to be practicing in the future. Uh, and this chapter really sort of discusses some of that um, and, and really virtual care, remote care is probably here to stay. And probably going forward, we're going to be looking at some kind of a hybrid model where, which offers the best of both worlds for patients and their practitioners to, to offer high quality care. Yeah, and I would echo that, Leslie, um, that I think the, uh, my sense is that this is going to be um, really truly much more patient-centered. I know we talk about that a lot in healthcare, um, but when you think about offering the option of do you wanna come in person, you know, will a phone connection or video connection work better for you? Um, and Sanjay, you didn't mention the parking costs as not just the time. Um, and I, I think that uh, it was more than three years ago when we tried to bring this software platform called Zoom into our healthcare system. And the door was just slammed shut really quickly. Oh no, there's no way that you can connect with patients and privacy and so on. And yet the pandemic really did push for a safe, effective um, platform to be able to connect with patients quickly. Uh, and I was you know, really, um, in some ways, I guess, surprised myself to see that in having, uh, I mostly do video connections with patients. Um, and finding that it very quickly got almost like, you know, you're sitting across from them in the room in terms of being able to have that meaningful um, interaction with the patient and, and figure things out from there. So I, I, my sense is that um, the, the, uh, the, the patient becomes just a much more significant partner uh, where it's a two-way thing. I'm, I'm hoping we can see the you know, patient being able to go in and select the patient at the appointment time that they want. Um, and, you know, and then again, the phone call or the video link to be able to do that, I think that's going to be much more efficient uh, for patients. And then those options to be able to track things uh, for themselves on, on apps or uh, whatever other ways and send those off to the clinic. Um, to me, this is just, I, I think we accomplished in, you know, three months what I was expecting was going to take another 10 years in terms of ways to get the care right into the home of the patient. Because um, before what we had was telehealth, where you still had to use clunky equipment to go to another health center and talk with the patient. There's a question actually, Dr. Graf, in the, in the Q&A about how patients can advocate for telehealth and continuing, you know, this virtual care model going forward. Is there anything that they can do other than obviously speaking to their doctor or nurse about encouraging its use? I, I actually think if, if patients do want to, well, first of all, I think um, that uh, the audience should be assured that um, those of us in healthcare on the other side of the table are advocating very strongly for what we have found has been very effective and helpful. Um, but I think actually that the patient could go um, to the uh, decision makers and the funders. So I think it's very appropriate to go to your health minister, to go to the CEO of you know, your hospital or your health service and say, this has worked well. I expect that this is going to continue in some way once we don't have the pandemic driving it. Yeah, within the bounds of safety, obviously, there's cases as as you all brought up that, you know, we will want to see you in person, and you have to understand if we want to see you in person, there's probably very good reason for that. 
absolutely. And but I think it, it comes back to there's now flexibility to be able to um, work in different ways in connecting with patients. And so um, uh, in person, I don't think we should stop in person. It's just that not everyone. I was going to that way. Go ahead, Dr. Xiao. Sorry. Um, thanks. Oh. I was just um, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt Dr. Graf. I just wanted to extend. Um, the comment that um, Dr. Benchamol said that whilst um, the alternative platforms provide the patient as well as us a lot of flexibility, there are select times that we really do want to see patients in person, particularly if it's a new consultation, if a person is feeling sick. Um, we, we do learn a lot from seeing you in person. Um, there are times, obviously, that we do need to examine you and you know, while we have improvements in the technology, I think patients also have to remember that we still need objective markers of disease activity. So whilst, you know, patients have been really happy to pick up the phone and not have to come into clinic, we still need other investigations. And those are important because they help build the case for whether you're sick or unwell. And so that might include blood tests, ultrasounds, other forms of imaging. So it's important to continue doing that because if you just tell us feeling pretty good or I'm not feeling so good, we still need a little bit more information in order to make that decision. So you can work alongside with us um, with that. That would be great. Eric, can and I say something? Um, of course. You know, what Leslie pointed out about um, not having access to uh, telemedicine uh, because government thought that would be a bad idea from a, a risk perspective. I would really encourage all the people participating in the webinar tonight to um, lobby their government. The governments have become um, almost um, bizarre about um, uh, patient privacy in a way that patients themselves don't even want it. So while we need government to maintain uh, phone medicine and uh, phone call medicine and other telemedicine that includes not just phone, but, you know, viewing whether it, there's, you know, Microsoft Teams or whatever platform is used for viewing. I can say that in Manitoba, our government still refuses to let patients access their own uh, investigations and blood work. It's an absolute absurdity. It's the patient's blood work. If they want to see what their blood results are, they should be able to access it. I know that in places, for instance, in Toronto, patients can access their blood work. But across Canada, I would encourage everyone to encourage their governments to stop this. I think it's ludicrous, um, uh, the preventing patients from getting access to their own results. It's, it's crazy. So this is the first, you know, it's been foisted upon us and upon government to let us communicate in this way um, this is then the next step, having, getting patients access to, you know, everything. They should get their CT results. They should be able to get a copy of it online, just like we can as physicians. That's great. Any final words about the care for the future? My final word is just to thank uh, Gil and Eric for an extraordinary uh, job. I'm speaking really on behalf of all of us, but I know that all of us would be saying the same thing, except I beat him to the punch. You guys have really done an absolutely amazing job. Um, unless somebody's paying you that I don't know about, I think you've taken this on uh, because it was in your soul. And so uh, we're all grateful for the incredible uh, job you both have done in leading this over the last uh, 16 months. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, you know, I think we also want to thank the, the task force who, who also spent a lot of time after hours on weekends in the evenings, you know, meeting and discussing and writing. And I think we all did this. I know we all did this as volunteers because we felt that it was important for patients to understand and know this information and really get the message out to patients. And we really wanted to help our patients uh, and patients across Canada and around the world with understanding the impact of COVID-19 on uh, them and their IBD uh, disease. So thank you all on the task force. Uh, I wanna thank my co-chair, Gil. Uh, Gil, thank you for being such an amazing partner and working through all of this. And 
I'm sure I know that we're all going to be working together more in the future, but I want to spend particular time and thank the staff uh, from Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Uh, firstly, Dr. Kate Lee, uh, Vice President of Research and Patient Services, who sat on the committee with us and provided the voice of patients and the voice of Crohn's and Colitis Canada throughout the last year and a half has really been instrumental in getting this all together and writing up the report and uh, all of those aspects of uh, you know representing Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Andrew Spesic, who um, is has worked extremely hard. I know I was getting emails from her sort of 11 o'clock last night about the report and getting it together and has really been the voice of getting the message out both on the website, the webinars, and now the report. So thank you so much, Angie, for your tireless work. Uh, Sarah Gander Hadrian, sorry, Sarah, if I blew your last name, but Sarah has been the behind the scenes person, uh, absolutely no glory at all because her face is never seen, her voice is seen, heard only at the beginning of the webinars. But Sarah has kept all the technical aspects together in terms of organizing all of these webinars and keeping us on task, keeping us on time, mostly, not always and uh, making sure that your questions get answered through the webinar. So we really appreciate, Sarah, all the hard work that you've done. And then Mike LeMay, who joined us in the last few webinars, we heard your requests for a French translation, a live interpretation as we were going with these webinars. And Mike has been amazing at providing that on the fly translation for you to French. Merci, Mike. Uh, you know, I think that it's been tough for Mike because we kind of changed the script around and we don't always keep the script. So thank you so much, Mike, for your uh, interpretation services as you've gone. Um, and I think that with that, we will wrap it up. You know, I think this is not the last time you're gonna see us. We will be back. If there's more information about COVID-19, we will provide it to you. But certainly these webinars will continue in some form or fashion in terms of helping you understand your IBD and the treatments involved with IBD and the latest research surrounding IBD and all of the activities that Crohn's and Colitis of Canada are providing. Please do let us know your feedback. Please let us know what you'd like to hear covered in future webinars. Please get vaccinated. And if you found these webinars useful, if you found the, the report useful, if you found the services that we've provided useful, please do consider making a donation to Crohn's and Colitis Canada at Crohn'sandcolitis.ca. Any amount of money that you can spare is greatly appreciated and really goes back to funding the research and the patient services that Crohn's and Colitis Canada provides. Of course, we will want to thank frontline workers, as we have every time we've done these webinars, whether it be physicians, nurses, other healthcare providers, or it be people working in grocery stores or on the factory lines. You've put yourselves at risk. Many of you have gotten COVID-19, unfortunately, but we're grateful for all the help you have. And that's the hospital telling me I need to end because my lights just went off. So again, if you want to donate, uh, I, I think the Gutsy Walk page is still open. We did meet our goal, so thank you all. But you can donate at Crohn's and Colitis uh, Canada.ca as well. And follow us on social. And thank you very much, everybody. Uh, take care.